a little bit about the the you know your in, you know individual exhibitions and the differences that you see in in the making of the exhibition. Francis, yours was a museum exhibition, and the basis of that was not only just simply to make an a, an exhibition with a certain intellectual and art historical thrust, but also to build a collection. And on the other hand, Casper's you know, exhibition was an exhibition, in a sense. Um, how can you talk about the differences between these two approaches to making historical exhibition? Maybe I should just, um, I suppose uh, one of the things about Veskunz that I think Casper uh, touched on was that um, Although looking at the, the list of artists now, it feels more or less like the canon. Yeah. And they are, you know, as you say, great artists that you would never, ever be able to bring together today in such quantities, with such stature. The way, the, the choices that, the, that Casper and the team made about which periods of the artist's career, which works, and then some of the conjunctions between them made everything feel unfamiliar and fresh and reconnected. So there was, there was, what was, there was something deeply unfashionable about many of the choices. So they were the, the derided moments of the artist rather than the ones that we think of always as being, you know, the, the kind of peak. And I think that um, that was very exciting for me and my generation of younger curators that beginning to sense in the 90s that, that there were other histories, that it wasn't just the story that the Museum of Modern Art told or the book that Herbert Reed had written, that you could, you know, artists, that there was still, everything was up for grabs, that the way you put work together could create something very new that relationships between artists were mutable and changeable. And I was very aware, a, a decade later, uh, coming to some of the same material. And I really, you know, Fautre was an artist that you reinvented for the world in that show. He, those extraordinary otage paintings with this, as you say, beautiful powdery uh, pastel colors, but made in this deep, you know, really, vicious, viscous material uh, was, was quite mind-blowing at that time as a, as a re, you know, reconnecting or a way of um, uh, going back into history afresh. And I was very aware in doing Paris post-war that uh, for a British audience, I was trespassing on deeply unfashionable ground. And uh, we were talking about this earlier. I originally came up with a slightly smaller list of artists and wanted to have some contextualization, which would have included artists like Bernard Buffet and Mathieu. Really, just artists were completely unacceptable to the sort of um, uh, cultural you know, uh, uh, establishment at that time. And I was persuaded by uh, my senior colleagues at Tate not to do that. And I was also persuaded that I should um, leaven the mix, lighten the mix with a room of Picasso, because Picasso would be the kind of, uh, the, you know, the, the fixed point that uh, audiences would latch on to. But that, that idea that you could do something with the unfashionable, I found very exciting about Veskunst. And you see that we got a lot of heavy formalist criticism, among others by Buchlo for Art Forum, that the Russian constructivist wasn't there, but the exhibition started in 39. So Tatlin, Lisitsky, when you look at it closely, there was no possibility for any progressive art at the time, you see? Stalin made it impossible. And all the great mo movements of modernism had disappeared. So it was sort of retour de l'ordre. The architecture was neoclassicist, not only in later on Nazi Germany, in Russia, in America, in England, in France. So it was a kind of a f different look at things, and we had a lot of time to really look very carefully and to focus and present, for instance, um, an artist who I admire very much is Stuart Davis. And at Reinhardt, I always thought it was fantastic when you have artists who are clear in their leftist politics, very articulate, 
but not in the art. The art is not. It's very political in terms of the integrity of the artist, but it's not an illustration of an ideology. So that contradiction was made quite clear in the exhibition, but that was due, the brain of the exhibition was Laszlo Glosa. You see, I was a maker of it. I would go and hustle. I would insist on certain loans, and then I was examined, you know, by the boss of, of the Museum of Modern Art. Is it a good picture? Is it a bad picture? I would, you know, I, had, I was examined, so I was some kind of a wild dog who insisted why it was important to have Mata from the 40s. He was not there, you see? But I think it has very much to do with the generational situation after the war, after the Nazi time. So, because usually if you focus on visual things, it can tend to be uh, relatively banal when you, you know, but when you say that art is a kind of manifesto and it stands for a certain attitude and a truth of aesthetics, not in terms of the daily truth, you get away with everything if it is really radical in terms of new. Now, all the architects who are involved, Sharon, Mies, Corbusier, Out, and so on, were so fantastically great architects, had such a strong quality that we consider this as an art historian event. No, it was a social, political manifestation which had a great aesthetic kind of depth. And now the art is so much part of the art world that it is very difficult to do something new. And the exhibition they are doing here now is an investment into the future. It will be very significant in five or 10 years for the whole world that Haus der Kunst is investigating a kind of a look at things which for us, partly are fascinating, but also makes it very difficult because we don't recognize it. We don't know it. So we are being introduced in a phenomenon which hasn't been understood yet, but it's existentially necessary to understand the contradiction and complexity of the world, right? I mean, this is the first of your trilogy you are working on. Really? Yeah, I still, what I, what I, when I think about when I, I know that this is a kind of uh, difficult thing to do, but when I compare our exhibition with, with yours, Francis, and yours, Caspers, of course, our it looks like as if our exhibition is much closer to what you did in Westkunst. So probably we were not so radical as you have been. For me, it was a surprise to see these, uh, these images that I haven't looked at for a while because I recall I was a student then and we were from our university, Max Imdal, my professor, we were obliged to see that show. He said, you have to go there, you have to look at that. And so I was, I was surprised that the, the ceilings were so low Actually, I have, it comp I have it completely different in my, in my memory. And, uh, it's so a cl classic curator um, disease to look at the, the walls and the ceilings and the floors, not the works of art. <laughs> <laughs> he was enchanted by these six Barnet Newmans. He went up to Absolutely, them. absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when I look, of course, at Francis's show, that looks much more uh, like... I mean, this show could be done today in the same way, probably, from the display. They were, okay. But uh, what I'm, yeah, want to point it at um, is that I think what we have in common with Casper is what you also mentioned, Francis, that is this relationship between the works being probably more important uh, than the single masterpiece. Although, uh, of course, you had, you had tons of masterpieces in that show, but especially I love this room with Albers and uh, Hopper, <laughs> which really made, you remember the show we did with Hopper in Cologne, yeah. um, which was really, show. this yeah. was, yeah, with Bushina. Mm. 
And uh, this was really made people think. And I think this is also something that we intend to, to have these narratives that create relationships between uh, the works. And um, I also think so that in between, my Im first impression was when, when we finished the installation that Haus der Kunst looks like an old-fashioned museum. And my second thought was that a museum could be proud if it would have these works as a collection. And so when I, we talked about this difference between exhibition making and curating, I feel myself a little bit in the middle of that. <laughs> Well, I think it's a very. Don't know what it is. I think it's a very good, um, you know, moment to kind of to explore what that means because you know, Francis, you you sort of you know mapped out a, a certain you know you know uh, genealogy of transformation of the Tate you know collection uh, and how your exhibition was you know positioned in the middle of that narrative. So in a sense, the exhibition is a cut in the body of the, of the, of the collection. And, and that cut you know, had to do with the kind of the visceral nature of the subject matter of, of, of Paris post-war for art and existentialism you know, during, this, in the, during this period. In, 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 in thinking about exhibition making or curating in a museum, uh, what do you see as a fundamental difference? Because I think that's what Uli is kind of hinting, you know, too, um, that there is a, I suppose there's a certain kind of polish, there's a certain kind of reification. I don't know if, if that's the correct word that one, you know, could ascribe, you know, to the, to the, to the methodology uh, or to the display, you know, uh, approach. So do you see that as something that is you know, fundamentally different in thinking about these kinds of exhibition, that one is a museum show with a collection, with a memory, with a set of references that it has to respond to, and the other is, you know, um, in a sense, in a kind of neutral you know, zone? I mean, you see, I mentioned that we, I just ordered your catalog Mm. for very little money on the internet. <laughs> and I always wanted to have your catalogue, and it was too expensive in an antiquarian bookshop. So I knew the catalogue quite well. But when you look at her catalogue, the intensity of Genie and Giacometti, mm. of the writers, and because that was an art which was not affirmative at all. It was very, very radical and dark, oppositional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that was more or less a time when the art world moved from Paris to New York, mm. right? And it was Ecole de Paris. And all the, the, the exhibitions which happened after the war here, which was very progressive, were all Ecole de Paris, you see? We don't talk about this very much. So the art world is also something which has a great amnesia. Mm. We, repress things which we think are very significant. There's a certain kind of arrogance because it happens today and everything is positive. Everybody loves art, but it becomes very meaningless when you don't f begin to focus and to find out what is the relevance, what is the, the source of energy. So your catalog basically is a kind of a, a world and we try to have six or seven contradictory worlds within this span, mm -hmm. 39 to 70. Yeah. But the advantage was that we built in a huge space just an exhibition. Yeah. You see? You have, if you are uh, in a museum, you always remember what was there before, what is before, what is after. It's always contextual. So this type of exhibition, I think exhibitions basically have become to a great extent uh, obsolete because everything is available on the internet and so on and so on. And why you mentioned Münster, what is interesting about Münster, that's why I'm still involved, is that it only happens every 10 years. And the you Bruce Nam, which was pr proposed yeah. in 77, 
was not possible. 10 years later, it was not possible. 20 years later, it was not possible. 30 years later, he became a well-known artist, and the piece remains the same, and it is possible. And in a way, the reception of that work in a public context, outdoors, maybe is good when you have this long delay, and it has a kind of theoretical underpinning, and people understand maybe more to take it serious. So, I think the term of an exhibition, I mean, world exhibitions, they are irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything anymore, right? You just take a plane and you're everywhere. However, the medium of showing something, publishing something, that is a value, and that has to be very uh, specific and articulate. So I think what you are doing is an investment into the future, because you show us something which we have no idea about. For instance, the irony on some of the works, which is to me like great comedian, you know, this, this Persian guy or this uh, Islamic uh, artist who is kind of Iraqi. Iraqi, he's displaying alcohol, uh, sort of women in loose clothes. It's, he's making fun of a kind of consumerist society, but at the same time, he also shows the kind of liberty alongside with it. And it's really a wonderful painting, and it's, I've never seen something like that before, and the same with a guy who is part of the, the atomic uh, explosion kind of team. Yes. Yeah. So there are different points of view which really make the world more complex, and I think that's why your exhibition has a, has a great potential into the future. I'm exhausted. I spent today three hours in the <laughs> exhibition. Oh, I went back to the cafe twice, and I still was exhausted. <laughs> So I come back tomorrow, but, but that's good. But it, it, uh, Casper, it, it, you talk about investment into the future, but it is it is a kind of retrieval of the past mm -hmm. because you know there are many of the artists in in this exhibition, and a number of them are artists that we are also now showing at the Tate were very present in their local scenes and were part of the uh, context and conversation that, for example, created you know the moment of that decade of Paris post-war. Mm. And they have, for uh, all sorts of reasons, been you know, written out of the history. And so the, I think the, the, the venture that's, that this exhibition um, or that is taking place here and that we're trying to pursue at Tate Modern is trying to open up some of that, uh, reveal some of that history. And uh, some of those artists are really extraordinary. Yeah, and I think you know, perhaps um, this is what I believe that makes the Tate, um, you know, quite extraordinary in this sense, simply because when you um, got rid of chronology in your first, the first iteration of Tate Modern, it enabled you to, you know, create different kinds of contextual relationships. And I would never really, you know, forget about the, the, the you know the, the the section nude body action, you know that transition to go from the kind of the classical figure, you know, to the subject, you know the kind of, you know, um, almost delusion, you know, perceiving you know subject now, you know the wild subjectivity of the you know the you know of acting, of enacting, you know, the self, it sort of really turned around how you, one might pursue the same topic, but from multiple perspectives. And now, could, that could mean that you could include artists from disparate, mm. you know, contexts. Because if you were to approach it chronologically, you will be working, you know, through established, you know, canonical, uh, you know, reasons for make, you know, making the case for why a work is in a particular section. And that room with the, with the Richier that you showed, um, you know, was a room that I looked at very, very carefully, you know, um, when, when, when you, reop you, know, when you uh, reopened this summer. Um, I, I was really, really struck with the display that you undertook, the density of the display, it was intentional, it, it seemed, and to see the work of 
Kim Kulim, Marcos Gregorian, uh, Pollock, Salahi, um, Mankoba, yeah. and all the rest in that mix. <clears throat> Suddenly, all these works seemed of the period, it was chronological, but it seemed of the period, you know, without, you know, the kind of divisions that we, you know, normally see in museums when, you know, pure chronology is, is applied. And, and so, you know, yes, there's, there's, there's obviously uh, a lot that we gained from the Tate during our research, because after all, we had, you know, um, some workshops at the Tate uh, in the past in which, um, you know, the you know, members of your team, um, you know, we are very important contributors in teasing out some of these questions. And, but w w what, what, what I'm wondering, though, is having established your collection at the Tate, do you see a possibility of undertaking an exhibition of this nature, or does the collection somehow this year the possibility well, it, of taking yeah. on a historical? It's interesting because um, talking about the you know relationship between collections and exhibitions, I think one of the things that sat, sits underneath the way we've worked with the collection at Tate since the end of the 90s is an exhibition model. Um, you know, we, we tend to think of permanent collections as being more or less permanently installed. And if you go to MoMA in New York, you kind of always find the expected things where you saw them the last time. But for a number of reasons at Tate, partly to do with aspiration, to use the collection as a kind of laboratory for th rethinking art history, but also the fact that we are um, four museums. From 2000 onwards, the collection has been permanently rotating in a way that, that is much more like the way you might configure an exhibition. The difference being that you're working with a, a group of objects that only grow very slowly as you acquire new things. So now there's a very... Um, uh, close relationship between acquisitions and the display. So we're always thinking, it, it's, a, it's a kind of very similar way to a, a curating an exhibition, but we're thinking, what will we bring into the collection on a permanent basis that will help us reconfigure the narratives in the gallery? So the answer to your question is whether we'd like to make an exhibition with the material. Uh, I, I think we would, the display has thrown up some ideas for particular exhibitions, but they would be using the display as a, as a starting point to explore some particular aspect of it. And so over the next few years, there'll be one or two thematic exhibitions, one that would look at um, the early part of the 20th century, and that one would look at the 1960s and 70s that will take as their starting point a number of things that we've be done in the displays. I wanted to ask you, Casper, and then I, you know, pass over to Uli. You know, you know, prior to West Coast, um, most of your exhibitions were were really working with members of your generation, contemporary artists, or making mostly contemporary exhibitions. And West Coast was the first historical exhibition. Why did you make that shift? No, I find since the last exhibition I did at the Museum Ludwig, for dem Gesetz, you know, before the law, the Kafka kind of quote, was very much about, uh, is it possible to have a kind of existentialist uh, aesthetic experience, which is rather naive. However, uh, we spent quite a lot of time discussing creating a special architecture. And then, since it was my last exhibition and I was a director, I said, the hell with it. I do it in the top floor. <laughs> Nobody can say no and have no architecture and spend no money on architecture, but use the top floor, which is, after all, 2,400 square meters with daylight, big rooms, and show very few works, you see? Fritz Kramer, Bleiche Mutter Deutschland, so it's a kind of a um, uh, post, uh, very kind of existentialist monument to, to 
to the people who are killed, who are lost in the war. And uh, he was a kind of devoted uh, communist, and he made this wonderful sculpture, um, sort of Kate Kolowitz in memory, but really tough. And it's based on a, on a, on a poem of, of uh, Bert Brecht, Bleiche Mutter Deutschland. Then there was uh, Barlow, she did a whole room, which was in relationship to the cathedral. Um, so there were uh, Bruce Norman work, there were a few works with a lot of space and some commissions by contemporary artists, but it was historical material of artists who have no particular interest in, like Gerhard Marx, who was right after the war very important in Germany, in East as well as West Germany, because he was not allowed to work during the, during the Nazi time. However, he was a traditionist artist. And some of these works have a very strong compact momentum, so that was an interesting farewell exhibition, and I made a big publication of 12 years based on the work in the museum. So even though museums have a kind of conservative momentum, I feel very strong in an institution like a museum, and it's very significant to invest so much energy as possible because it contains so much complex information and it allows people to find out about themselves, you see? So, therefore, I, I congratulate you on your initiative for this exhibition because it's an investment, you see? For me, it's also a lot of, it is unfamiliar, but it makes me ask questions and think about it. And therefore, I think the, 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 the art uh, exhibitions, on, they, are, they should be more investigative and less kind of just displaying uh, something uh, for, for an audience which you don't take really serious. I think you cannot take people serious enough. If you make it sort of popular, then it's a disgrace to what you are showing and ultimately also to the public. You see? So it's, it, it's important to go with a risk into the future, and I think that's what your exhibition is doing. We will yeah. need a room of Pollocks one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Pollocks, of Picasso <laughs> one of these days. You know, what I, what I was always very impressed by the many things that we did together, and it's, it, you, you said it in a very brief sentences in your presentation. We wanted to make things complicated, and um, to make things complicated, because I think this is something that maybe we, and this is probably your criticism about the contemporary inflation of exhibition making, um, that exhibitions are often meant to to explain things, to make very complex complicated things, easy to understand. And uh, this is something what I, I really learned from you, is that an exhibition is something that really, that really shows the complexity of art and at the same time um, how simple an artwork can transfer a complex content, which language and all what we are doing, writing, saying, lecturing, and so on. We try very hard to do it, but we never come uh, to do it in the way a single artwork can do it. And the uh, second thing I wanted to mention is what Francis said, that by restructuring, finding this new structure of pre uh, presenting and uh, um, in a collection, not in a chronological order, like in a traditional museum, like a traditional museum has done for decades and for centuries, um, but to do it thematically, it brought in all these new ideas, new narratives, new artworks, new artists, but now probably we come to that point, and maybe this is something that also goes with Casper to look into the future that we, in a certain way, regain the chronology again. Mm. Because this is also something we, we, we had a lot of 
discussion about how do we structure this enormous material that we have available for this exhibition. And of course, we also discussed the possibility of doing it in a kind of chronological order, which we then didn't follow. Um, but of course, there is a lot of chronological thinking in the, in the concept as of the exhibition. In, in contemporary art, we are used to, to have a global look. This is kind of familiar. But don't, but, you, don't you think that just, just as we're, we're now, as you're doing in this exhibition, playing with a number of different narratives, his, chronology becomes a kind of concertina. So in, you, mm -hmm. can have, you can play with different time frames. Absolutely. Sometimes you're looking Absolutely. at a moment in time. Mm -hmm. Other times you need to stretch mm -hmm. history a little bit. So, and that's the way that I'm thinking about history now. The elasticity. So you bring of, yeah. back time, but yeah. it, with different yeah. time frames. Well, we, we, you know, it might be a good time to uh, uh, invite. It's a great extent. It's a question of craftsmanship, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 If to you do your things, you have to do them well, and you have to think about the public. And so, for instance, mm -hmm. even though I never grew up in a museum, I'm a real. I love the museums. I find they have a kind of erotic charge to it. It's interesting to look at people looking at <coughs> something. And you don't have to know them. It's nice to be with people you don't have to know. There is a kind of intensity. And it's really important to do it essentially. And that's, for instance, when you said you did, for the first time, you had cases displaying poetry by Genet, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever mm -hmm. it is. Certain kind of uh, Beckett, and he would do very, very little. But what he did, he did it really was to the point. And so that, I think, um, is what, I mean, that is a problem you have because you have so much, right? And if you would have 10 times as much space, you could organize it in a maybe more intense way. But this wouldn't serve the, the public at all because it, then it would really overwhelm. I mean, it, 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 because this What's is really... What's wrong with overwhelming? <laughs> yeah, but this is really, that was the, the, our, our difficulty. But in the book, you have a lot of uh, uh, journalistic photography yeah. which contextualizes it very much, mm. you see? Which we also wanted to show more deeply into the exhibition, but we didn't find a place for it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, don't say that. But, I, but I, actually, I know you're going to open the question, but I think one, the, one of the really great things about the exhibition is that you pave the way now for lots of other exhibitions where people will really dig in, pick apart, bring context, explore, research. It's, there, is a, there is a moment in time to kind of throw the cards on the table, and that's, that's what this exhibition does. It airs a, a lot of stuff, but lots of, is unresolved, but there are lots and lots of questions there, and that's very exciting. Thank you. Um, so, questions, comments, observations? Um, critique. Cr yeah. Critique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there any? Ah. Okay, in that case, I will, uh, I'm not going to end it just yet. Um, <laughs> Um, and you know, just following up from what you know, Francis and Casper um, have each, you know, said about investment into the future. For us, it's um, you know, being an, an institution that has that holds no collection. We we make exhibitions, uh, but there is an institutional memory embedded here in House of Cones, uh one that is very palpable uh, in terms of its response to the period covered by Caspar's exhibition 39 to 1970. Um, we find ourselves in a moment of um, incredible disciplinary um, you know, shift, and this disciplinary shift owes a lot to many young scholars who are now probing um, the, some of these unresolved areas of, of the field. And, and it is from them that we are learning. It's from them that we are um, 
you know, finally understanding, you know, why particular, you know, ideas or works and features of those works made sense in specific, you know, places. So, um, if you enter the middle hall to see that electric dress by, you know, Atsuko Tanaka and uh, um, from 1955, and from the first Gutai exhibition, and you know Sadamasa Motanaga's, you know piece on the um, uh, hanging uh, across the hall from the same exhibition. Uh, it's really quite amazing to you know bring these two works together with the Hiroshima panels, um, you know, basically done during the same period during the 50s. In, a, in war of its Japan, so there is a, a sense of desolation on the one hand in the Hiroshima panels, and on the other hand there's this sense of euphoria, of you know, experimentation that artists were undertaking uh, during this period. And this, for me, um, you, know, you know, sort of layers the kind of narratives that, um, that are beginning to be explored. I just want to mention one particular room that we discussed very, very clearly and came to a decision to present it in that way. And that is a section called Nation Seeking Form. This idea of nations in you know, moments of, of change, whether it's independence, whether or nations that have been divided, Germany, you know, East and West, Korea, North and South, uh, you know, uh, India, you know, Pakistan and India, and so on, and so Israel and Palestine. So all those, you know, you know, divisions and ruptures were represented, but we decided to add the United States into it and to put at the center of this the fact that the kind of narrative of American power about freedom itself was also a contradiction in relation to what was taking place in the country during the post-war period, because the post-war period forced a recognition um, in the United States about the, um, how untenable you know, the, its position in the international context was in relation to what was happening domestically. So to bring Jasper Johns, Robert Indiana, Larry Rivers, Jack Whitten, Warhol, and Andrew Larry Johnson into that context was a way to sort of to open up the, um, the way we, in which we think about moments of you know, liberation and context like that. So exhibitions like this really enable us to think some of these in Congress moments and to see if there can be a way to bring some, some reflection or resolution to parts that have been left out in other narratives. And, um, and this, you know, for sure, Paris post-war and Veskunst, um, if you go into the exhibition, you can see very clearly um, you know, how important the, the thinking behind these ex two exhibitions um, was for us as we were planning. So I thank Frances and Casper very much for being here and all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.